Right. So let me go ahead and start. Um, so I would like to thank everybody, and particularly uh, Pietro, who's had a bit of an accident, as you can all see, uh, to join us uh, for this uh, wonderful uh, upcoming talk. Um, just wanted to say a few words once again about the online SPICE SPIN Plus X seminars. This is an initiative between the Spin Phenomenon Interdisciplinary Center that I, together with Kyron Everett, or City Lead, uh, and the collaborative center Spin Plus X uh, between Kaisos Latin and Minds, uh, whose co organizers here, Martin Ashleyman, Burger Hille Brands, and uh, Matthias Chloe, um, are joining us here as well. Uh, and we, this is, we have once a week on Wednesdays, this uh, seminars, the format is on Zoom. Uh, webinars, meaning that right now you can ask questions, uh, but you are muted uh, during the time of the talk. I will be monitoring the questions and uh, will try to answer anything directly that can be answered. And I will only stop Pietro Gambardella if it's completely necessary. If not, I will maintain and keep those questions on there and give you the floor uh, later after the talk is finished uh, so you can ask them directly as well and have a conversation with Pietro directly. Uh, just uh, this, uh, you know, we'll try to monitor things, please be, be polite. Uh, if not, I, I'm afraid I will have to take action and kick you out. Um, keep in mind also that we have many good lineup speakers uh, coming up and Rico the Barco will be next, as well as Stuart Parking on the, on the 24th of, of, the, of the month. With this, I'd like to introduce the speaker, Opa. Uh, and then, to, uh, so Pietro Gambardella is well known in the community uh, because he effectively discovered in 2011, uh, was considered the discoverer of the spin orbit torques in the magnetic structure systems, uh, very important in, in, his, in his spintronics. He's a full professor at ETH uh, in Zurich. And uh, before that, he was in Barcelona heading the atomic uh, the group uh, in the Catalan Institute of Nanotechnology uh, for six years. And he, his education was in Switzerland, uh, where he received a PhD and um, from Diploma di Laureata in Physica in University of Genova uh, in Italy. He's Italian, but almost Spanish. Uh, I can tell you that he speaks perfect Spanish. Um, so at heart, I think he's part of the Spanish as well. He works a lot on magnetic electronic transport properties, single atoms uh, and single molecule magnets and hybrid uh, interfaces, and uh, very strongly on X-ray absorption, to, uh, dynamics of uh, spintronics uh, and the scanning and tunnel microscopy. Also now uh, adventuring to, uh, and been leading some of the efforts in this uh, MD center type of microscopy. And of course, you can see that he has got many awards and then I like this uh, this nice little caricature. This is actually, if you see the caricature, you catch your underneath his uh, picture is exactly what happened to the poor man a, a couple of weeks ago, uh, but brave enough, he decided to continue and do the talk. So with this, I'm gonna stop sharing now my, my uh, talk. And then please go ahead, uh, Pietro, and you have the floor. Uh, start sharing your presentation when you wish and, and start the talk. Okay, thank you, Jairo, and thank you to the entire SPICE team for having me this afternoon, giving this talk. And also welcome to everybody who has decided to, to join us. So I'll start uh, sharing the presentation. So, Uh, well now? Yeah, perfect. Okay. Good. So I'll start by saying that the work I will present today is the result of uh, two uh, large collaborations. One with IMEC, and in, in particular with Kevin Garello, who led the uh, uh, spinning orbit torque group there in the development of uh, three terminal magnetic panel junctions. And the other collaboration is with a group of Lara Heiderman at the Paul Scherer Institute and ETH in, in Zurich, and in particular with Sao Chiu Luo and Alice Trabuk. 
And then uh, it's also a pleasure to thank the people who work with me in, uh, in Zurich, uh, Eva Grimandi, who did a postdoc with us, Viola Krizakova, who's a PhD, Wong Dao, Alice Rabek, uh, Martin Berlin, South South. Bend. So um, I will start by giving an introduction. That's something that uh, Hiro basically forced me to do. So um, here it goes. So um, it's about more, a little bit more than 50 years that uh, man landed on the moon. This is the Apollo 11 mission on uh, sometime in July 1969. And uh, one interesting thing about this mission, among many others, uh, here you see Buzz Aldrin's in the lunar landing module, is that the computer on board this system was the first uh, uh, computer using silicon integrated circuits. And also it had a, a memory, an onboard memory, a magnetic core memory that uh, remained in use for many years. We now have almost forgotten about it, but the magnetic core memory was basically the main type of random access memory for about 20 years, up until 1975, when then eventually it was replaced by semiconductor memory. However, because of its reliability, it stayed in use in the space shuttle until the 1990, and basically even survived the, the Challenger crash in 1986. And as you can see, it's an interesting type of memory uh, made of tiny magnets interwoven with, with metal wires. It's non-volatile, so it's a fairly respectable clock rate. And uh, this um, capacity of 32 kilobytes per cubic foot, which I think is quite uh, a number. OK. Uh, and it works by electrical uh, reading and writing, but the, the schemes used to, to uh, uh, in particular, to, to read it are quite uh, cumbersome. They require uh, destroying the bit state and then writing it again. And also, as you can well imagine, this structure is not uh, really scalable because, in fact, uh, some of these memories were even made by, by hand. And so, part of our community uh, is uh, working on a replacement for random access memories that are nowadays mainly uh, semiconductors. Uh, based. And uh, this is a famous icon of a magnetic random access memory made of an array of magnetic tunnel junction. So uh, now such memories uh, operated by spin transfer torques are already on the market. And uh, one of the main drives for introducing this type of memories in the market is to reduce the power consumption in uh, computers and processors because these memories offer. Uh, non-volatility together with speed and endurance. And they're also scalable below, beyond uh, current limits for SRAMs. And so uh, it is um, hope that they uh, eventually can replace uh, part of this um, uh, volatile memories in, in high level memories in, in current processors and in computers, and therefore save a lot of energy. So, uh, also, if you're interested about spintronics, then there are other aspects that we, we need to consider, namely that uh, in future development of electronics in general are hampered by the, uh, the failure of uh, two famous scaling laws. One is Dennard's law that uh, basically stopped working already. 15 years ago that uh, predicted that the power necessary to run a transistor would scale with the aerial size of the transistor. And this is not true anymore, which means that when processors are scaled down in dimensions, the power remains constant. And then the devices heat up to a level that is not acceptable anymore, uh, leading also to a lot of losses uh, in terms of uh, leakage current in the system. And uh, the other famous law is Moore's law, uh, which concerns the, the, the scaling of the size of devices. And certainly we know that as, as this uh, minimal feature of uh, semiconductor devices approach the, the 10 nanometer limit, at some point this will also stop forcing developers to, to, be, uh, to, to find creative um, 
solutions like uh, integration in three dimensions. And uh, there is an interesting playground for us uh, working in Spintronics because uh, by adding new functionalities to electronics, we can uh, keep a positive trend in integration going. And uh, this relies on finding both new type of uh, basic devices that combine different functions, uh, as well as finding uh, effects that are able to store and convert uh, electrical signals in a more efficient way than we can do today. And so these are uh, some of the practical motivations that we are concerned. I hope that Hiro is satisfied with, with this. So. Uh, but then many of us are also driven by more fundamental motivations, which can concern the uh, study of fundamental interaction, in particular, uh, the ways in which uh, different, uh, for example, momenta, linear momentum, angular momentum can be converted uh, between each other. Uh, this has to do, of course, with, with uh, spin orbit coupling. Uh, and also the way in which uh, different types of stimuli, for example, temperature, uh, light, or uh, electric polarization can be led to interact with uh, the typical uh, parameters that, uh, that characterize the spintronic system, so magnetization and uh, currents. Now, uh, I have to focus a little bit. So a, one of the most prominent examples of an interconversion effect between the charge current and the spin current is the spin hole effect, which was predicted a long time ago and then uh, finally confirmed experimentally in, in semiconductors in 2004, whereby uh, if you have a conductor uh, with a strong spin orbit coupling interaction, then a, a, an electric current flow in this conductor will, uh, the, the electrons in this current will be deflected depending on their spin. So there is a spin dependent scattering phenomenon which can be either of intrinsic nature or extrinsic, uh, resulting in a, in a spin current. And this spin current then uh, travels towards the edges of the conductor and induces an accumulation of spins at the boundaries of the conductors. And uh, as you see in this schematic here, where uh, the, the red region is the uh, proportion to the spin accumulation and the arrows indicate the spin polarization. And the figure of merit for this conversion is the so-called spin hole angle, which is the ratio of the spin current to the charge current or the spin hole conductivity to longitudinal conductivity. And uh, this in, in sort of our standard materials like heavy metals, like platinum has already quite uh, significant values around uh, 0.1, which means that 10% of a charge current can be converted into a spin current. And uh, another interesting parameter is the spin diffusion length, which characterizes the, um, the extension of the spin accumulation uh, from the edge of the conductor uh, inward. There are other mechanisms that can generate uh, spin accumulation uh, starting from an electric current. And another famous one is the so-called uh, Rush by Edelstein effect, which was also uh, postulated several years ago and then uh, detected in several systems, semiconductors, uh, as well as uh, other systems uh, more recently. And uh, here, uh, the um, the main uh, point about this effect is that an electric current traveling into a system with, uh, that is not inversion symmetric uh, feels a, an electric field due, for example, to uh, unequal charges on, a, on, on the top and bottom of an interface. And uh, this electric field is then uh, seen by the uh, electrons in the rest frame as a, as a magnetic field, which orients their spin uh, transfers to the current. Okay. And this uh, also generates a, a spin polarization. The spin polarization can then diffuse into a magnet and give rise to effective magnetic field. So uh, there are several uh, varieties of this effect, but mainly these are the, the two main ones discussed in the literature. 
And uh, what is relevant for us now is that uh, if you couple a material where such effects are prominent, so for example, a heavy metal or a system with an uh, interfacial uh, rush by effect, then uh, by injecting a current, you can generate a spin accumulation. And if then a magnetic material is deposited on top of this uh, heavy metal system, then the spin current can diffuse and uh, be absorbed by the ferromagnet. And uh, in doing so, then uh, essentially this corresponds to uh, torques, to uh, so-called spin torques or spin orbit torques acting on the magnetization of the magnetic lake. And uh, there are two types of torques that are uh, allowed by symmetry. One is the so-called damping-like torque, and the other one is the so-called field-like torque. And, um, or you can describe the same effects by physically uh, converting the torque into effective magnetic fields. Okay. So uh, there, there, there are uh, uh, broad discussions in the literature about the origin of these effects, the strength of the torque, the angular dependence of the torques. All these are uh, now summarized in, in this review. So I will move on to uh, some practical applications of, of these effects. The first one is uh, current-induced magnetic switching. And uh, here, this is a um, demonstration of this effect where uh, we have a, a, a paramagnetic dot with perpendicular magnetization. Here is cobalt. And uh, this dot is deposited onto platinum. This is a whole cross. And if a current is injected in platinum, then if the current is strong enough, the magnetization of this layer can be reversed. And uh, in, can be reversed in such a way that if you reverse the current, also the magnetization reverses. So uh, this is um, a, a very powerful demonstration of, of the presence of these torques. Uh, but there are, of course, also other I'll show you another interesting uh, switching example here. Uh, so in the previous example, we had a cobalt uh, ferromagnet. Now we have a, an insulating ferromagnet. So this is a tulium iron garnet layer on top of which we have deposited a, a, um, a platinum hole bar. You just see the, the, the contours of the hole box. And by applying current pulses, I hope this works. Yeah. This is the usual trick here. Let's see. Okay, it doesn't work, so we'll go on to the interesting stuff. So anyway, the important point here is that uh, this current-induced torques have many applications, not only in switching, but also in inducing uh, high frequency oscillations or even auto oscillations, uh, domain wall motion, spin wave excitations. And uh, they extend the range of spin torques, not only to conducting materials, but also to uh, basically all types of magnets, including insulators, including antiferromagnets and ferromagnets. And so they're really an interesting tool to manipulate the, the magnetization of the system. I should also add, just as a comment to Hiro's introduction, that uh, I believe that uh, we, we did not demonstrate the first occurrence of spin orbit torque, uh, maybe switching, but spin orbit torques are quite an old topic. And if you dig in the literature, you'll find several examples uh, in uh, where, where it, effects were detected, maybe not always correctly attributed, but um, where uh, unusual current induced effects were observed. And some of these are described in, in this review. So now of interest to this talk is the use of uh, spin orbit torques, torques to uh, control the state of magnetic tunnel junction. So on the left side, you see a so-called STT MTJ, so spin transfer torque MTJ, where the uh, state of the junction, that is the orientation of the free layer, is uh, determined by uh, the, the spin transfer torque 
resulting from uh, current injection in the pillar. The current has been polarized by the reference layer and then uh, exerts a spin torque on the free layer. Now, this is a two terminal device. But if we move on to a three terminal device, then we can use a spin orbit torque to uh, control the magnetization of the bottom layer and then a top electrode to read the state of the junction uh, by essentially reading the, the tunneling magneto resistance. Now, there are advantages and disadvantages to each of these approach. For example, STTMTJ uh, is a two terminal device, so it scales better in terms of dimensions. Uh, so far, it operates at uh, smaller current densities, uh, whereas a three terminal device takes more space, of course, and also uh, requires so far larger current densities. But it can go faster, as we will see, and it has also other advantages in terms of uh, reliability of operation. So uh, there are several implementations of uh, three terminal magnetic tunnel junctions looking at perpendicular MTJs and as well as in plane MTJs uh, where the in plane magnetization can be oriented either uh, orthogonal to the current or collinear to the current. All these uh, systems work quite well. And there are also other advantages in going through uh, three terminal devices. Uh, so uh, three terminals are certainly more than two, maybe not always better. But for example, they allow for uh, applying a voltage uh, to the stack, to the MTJ stack during uh, current injection in the bottom electrode. And this voltage can decrease the magnetic anisotropy of the free layer. This is so-called VCMA effect, voltage control of magnetic anisotropy, and result in more efficient or accelerated switching. At the same time, one can uh, uh, use both STT and SOT to uh, assist the switch. Another interesting point about three terminal MTJs is that um, the uh, direction of the torque, of the spin orbit torque, is in, in the case of a, of a perpendicular device, is orthogonal to the uh, magnetization of the free layer at rest. And so ideally, this torque acts instantaneously on the magnetization. Whereas in the classical spin transfer torque geometry, unless you have uh, some uh, you know, orthogonal polarization layer, then the torque is collinear with the magnetization direction. And uh, this means that the, there is a, a sizable incubation time before a, uh, some thermal fluctuation displaces the magnetization and then the torque can start rotating. Okay. So uh, in, in theory, uh, then spin orbit torque switching should be faster than, than STT switch. And indeed, uh, experiments done so far, so these are experiments where magnetic tunnel junction is pulsed, one pulses the bottom electrode and then measures the TMR after the pulse, uh, reveal uh, reliable switching, even using current pulses that are uh, half a nanosecond long. And also this type of devices present uh, very uh, low write error rates um, that uh, make it possible to really reduce the, the, the pulse length to, to the order of a nanosecond. However, none of the measurements presented so far uh, has been performed in the time domain. And so the dynamics of the switching uh, remains a little bit uh, concealed so far. So uh, this was the um, aim of this experiment that I will present uh, now, uh, was uh, to measure the current induced switching in three terminal magnetic tunnel junctions in a time result way. And so here um, we uh, had the pleasure to collaborate with Kevin Garello and, and the IMAC team uh, shown here who uh, went to several opti optimization steps to make uh, three terminal uh, magnetic tunnel junctions that can uh, switch very nicely both by SOT and STT. And the measurements were performed by Eva Grimaldi, Viola Kuzakova with the assistant, uh, assistance of Giacomo Salvo. So this is uh, a, a cross-sectional image of the device. What you see 
is uh, the MTJ is just this this tiny uh, pillar here. This uh, line here is a, is a beta tungsten current line about four nanometer thick. Uh, this is the SOT electrode, and then on top we have the SDT electrode that you see here. This is a close-up view of this perpendicular MTJ with cold iron boron prefix. Uh, so these junctions have a, a TMR of almost uh, 100%. You see this is the, the resistance in the uh, parallel state and anti-parallel state uh, is a function of out-of-plane magnetic field. And the way we connect these devices is by having, uh, essentially we have a single pulse generator and we split the, the pulses in, in such a way that we can apply pulses of variable amplitude to the uh, bottom and top electrode. And these pulses eventually generate what we call the VSOT. So that's the, the voltage driving the SOT current and the and SOT switching and the VSDT, uh, which is the voltage driving the, the current across the field. Uh, and uh, at the end of the device, then we connect the device to a fast scope to detect the uh, voltage during the, the switch. Okay. One thing that is not always obvious, it, should, it, it is obvious, but it, it's not always uh, considered, at least in, in the literature, is the fact that when uh, one applies a, a pulse uh, in this way, so two pulses to the junctions, then the uh, effective voltage drop across the pillar is not just determined by the, the voltage at the applied to the top pillar, but it also depends. Uh, from the voltage applied to the bottom pillar. So you have a, like a voltage partition here. So for our devices, this gives this dependence of the VSDT uh, bias to the VSOT bias. Good, so the first thing that uh, we did was to characterize the probability of switching just by applying pulses of uh, variable length. So you see here the length in, in the nanoseconds. And then measuring after switching, measuring the TMR and see if the junction had switched and uh, uh, do some statistics on, on that. And what we see is that indeed we have very sharp uh, transitions here from, from no switching to, to switching. So this is uh, sort of the critical voltage for SOT switching is around uh, 0 0.4, 0 0.5 volts for uh, five nanosecond long pulses and then it increases uh, to about 0.8 for uh, pulses that are uh, about 300 picoseconds. For STT, we we'll observe uh, a larger voltage threshold, but also uh, the fact that beyond, so below a certain pulse length, the junction do not switch anymore. And uh, we believe this is due to, to back hopping. And so uh, basically, uh, we cannot uh, achieve reliable switching. Uh, using pulses shorter than five nanoseconds in this case. Okay. And here you see the TMR levels during this, this measure. Now, more interesting is uh, measuring in the time domain and in particular, single shot measurements. So these are, uh, these are voltage traces of uh, essentially representing the change of the tunneling magnetic resistance during a current pulse in uh, four different situations. The first one is the classical STT only, so there is no SOT bias. The two SOT terminals are not rounded here. And um, uh, the STT uh, bias is pulsed, uh, pulses that are uh, 15 nanoseconds long, and we can measure uh, the variation of the uh, junction resistance during the pulse. And what we see is that for these are just 10 randomly chosen switching events, we see uh, switching uh, happening, uh, but with quite wide transitions from, from low to high state here. And uh, also with an incubation time with a very large um, spread of, of possible incubation time. Then uh, we move on to the SOT switching. Now, in order to measure the, the TMR during a pulse, even uh, we, we need to inject a small STT pulse as well. We need to have a current running through the junction in order to measure the resistance of the junction. So uh, 
but we can control the amount of current. So uh, in this first case, we keep it low, and moreover, we keep it in a direction that actually uh, hinders SOT switching. And so that's why we write SOT minus SDT. And what we see is that uh, here, again, the junction switches. But again, there are uh, quite long transitions and uh, very long um, incubation times. So uh, times during which nothing happens. Okay. And this is very unexpected for SOT because for the reasons I mentioned before, uh, SOT is an instant on torque. And so why isn't it uh, doing something in the first five nanoseconds, right? This was uh, very surprising to us at first. Then we see that by increasing the bias on the top electrode, so uh, adding STT, but adding STT also means adding VCMA, so voltage control of magnetic anisotropy. We see that uh, these curves basically line up in that uh, now we have a much smaller spread of incubation times and much sharper transitions. And if we apply a stronger in-plane field, and here, I forgot to mention that all the SOT measurements are performed in the presence of an in-plane field that is used to determine the polarity of the switching that has to do with the mechanism of SOT switching, the, uh, the way uh, nail the main walls move in, in, uh, under the action of the tendon. Uh, spin orbit. If this uh, field is increased, yeah, yeah. Pietro, hang on for a second. I think the 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 voice is a little bit choppy at the moment. Are you still online? Uh, yes, I can hear you now. I think. Uh, can you hear me? Yeah, now we can hear you again. Yeah, now it's come back on. I think it takes a time. Maybe, maybe turn off your. Yeah, go ahead and come back on. Okay. Do you see me? Yeah, I can see you. I think it was just a, a temporary uh, low internet connection from your side. Now it's okay. okay. Go ahead and start again, or start from where you were. Yeah. Go ahead and share the screen. Can you share the screen? Okay, sorry. No problem. You may want to uh, pause your, your um, when you start the screen, uh, you may want to pause your video just to allow more bandwidth. Yeah, okay. Okay, we see the screen now. Go ahead and start from that point. I wish I could. <laughs> <laughs> Takes a little time. It's okay. So, it will come in a second. Okay. Yeah, perfect. Go ahead and maybe you turn off the video uh, itself and then the, uh, keep the voice and then that would be better, maybe. Yeah. Okay. So, uh, yeah, I was describing these curves. I hope you got it, but if you didn't, then uh, you'll get it the next slide. So, um, we did uh, several of these um, studies of uh, single shot switching events. Uh, so that we could build the statistics of the relevant times. So this is a single shot trace, and we define as the incubation time T0, this uh, initial time when the, uh, basically nothing happens, and then the transition time, this is this delta T time during which the magnetization effectively reverses. Okay. So we have statistics uh, for T0 here, for delta T here, and for the cumulative switching time here on the ground. And uh, what changes here is the uh, bias that we apply. So the first case is pure SDT, no SOT. These are the, the blue distributions. 
And you see that STT has a, a finite, fairly large incubation time, even larger uh, reversal time. So this, these RAMs are, are very broad. Okay, and this brings to it a, a total switching time in the order of nine, 10 nanoseconds average. SOT uh, in the unbiased uh, situation also is characterized by a very uh, large incubation time, which however can be reduced by applying STT bias or by increasing the field. Okay. And uh, you see here, this is the, the strongest STT bias that we applied which is, however, well below the STT switching threshold. So this is, uh, I think, at least less than 20% of the switching threshold by STT. Okay. Uh, now, if we apply a stronger in-plane field, so 90 millitesla instead of 23 millitesla, now we see that these curves uh, really uh, reduce in, in uh, time, so now we have a different scale here. And in particular, in the fastest uh, um, configuration that we, we probed, we see that we can achieve uh, switching in about a nanosecond. And what is really, I think, remarkable here is not, all, not uh, just the, the total switching time, but mainly the, the width of the dis distribution, which is really very narrow. So this means that uh, all of the trials basically switch within a nanosecond plus or minus uh, 100 picoseconds. And that's really good for the reproduci reproducibility of the switch. OK, so uh, then, uh, as I said at the beginning, we do not expect an incubation time in SOT switching. So why is there one? And why is it so large? Okay. And so uh, in order to understand that, uh, we have to take into account the fact that when you measure very fast, contrary to, to uh, you know, DC measurements or microsecond long pulse measure, the device is initially cold. And our devices are also perpendicularly magnetized with a fairly strong perpendicular anisotropy. So the magnetization is quite rigid. And so it turns out that in order to uh, assist the switching, you have to heat the device. Heating the devices has several effects. And as we know from basic magnetism, it reduces the, so this is a, a simulated uh, temperature profile of our devices using console. Uh, so temperature varies by about 100 uh, degrees during a pulse. You see the, the, the pulse shape is the dashed line. Here. Okay, so this temperature rise uh, induces a, a decrease of saturation magnetization decrease of the exchange parameter, but most importantly, and this is the most relevant part, uh, is a decrease of the anisotropy energy. I, I mixed the formula here, the anisotropy is, is this plot. And the reduction of perpendicular anisotropy is uh, one of the key aspects here. Uh, and only after the anisotropy is reduced, then uh, the spin orbit torque can nucleate a domain, typically at one edge of the dot, and then the spin orbit torque will drive the domain wall across the dot and achieve the reverse. So the longest, the long incubation time is actually a heating time. And then uh, the, the short transition time, according to the simulation and also according to, to uh, um, scanning X-ray microscopy experiments that we performed some years ago, uh, is the domain wall propagation time. Another interesting effect in this three terminal junctions is the fact that whenever you apply an STT bias, you're also applying a, a voltage to the, to the free layer, uh, which can modulate the magnetic anisotropy of the free layer. And uh, generally, the two effects are uh, superposed, but one can distinguish them because the uh, spin transfer torque is odd if you reverse the, um, the reference layer magnetization. Okay. So by reversing the reference layer, the spin transfer torque changes sign, uh, whereas the, the VCMA effect is even upon reversal of the reference. And so the two effects can be uh, distinguished 
and uh, by performing measurements at, uh, with reversed reference layer. And one can observe the changes of the critical voltage for switching uh, due to VCMA and SDT. And we, we find that both effects are present, but the most prominent and important one for fast switching is actually VCMA, not really SDT, at least at the uh, small current densities that we use in this study. Another aspect that is relevant for uh, integration purposes and, and finally applications of uh, spin orbit torque magnetic tunnel junctions is the fact that, uh, as I said, we need a mean plane magnetic field to determine the polarity of the switch. Now, there are several, uh, in particular for perpendicular magnetized tunnel junctions. Uh, there are several ways to uh, uh, eliminate the need for, for field that have been proposed in the literature, for example, based on exchange uh, bias uh, layers that provide an effective in plane magnetic field. Uh, and uh, here I present an approach developed at IMEC again by, by Kevin Garella and colleagues that is integration friendly in the sense that it can be um, basically implemented at the time that the, the, these devices are, are made, which consists in using a hard mask, uh, so using a metal layer for a hard mask that is magnetic. And here, uh, this is a, a fairly thick cobalt magnetic layer that is deposited on top of the pillar. And the stray field produced by this uh, layer on top of the pillar then uh, acts as an in-plane field for the junction. And this is enough to allow for very fast switching. And this is what we have shown recently in these measurements by, by Viola, who uh, could show that in the absence of an external field, we can achieve uh, seven nanosecond switching uh, just by uh, driving up the, the SOT voltage. So uh, now when it comes to comparing different effects, uh, we know we've seen that with SOT only switching, uh, if we turn up, up the voltage, so here we're about two times the critical voltage, we can switch in uh, about 300 picoseconds. Okay, so that's the, what you see here, this is the pulse profile, and this is a, a, an average of several uh, time-resolved switching traces, uh, which show that basically uh, before the pulse is finished, we achieve full cool switching in most of the cases. So SOT is certainly very fast, and we've seen that in our devices, it's hard to switch by SDT reliably below five nanoseconds. But if we compare the energy required to switch, then we have to consider also the current. And uh, the current required for switching by SOT is uh, still in the 10 to the 8 ampere per square centimeter, if you want to switch very fast, uh, at least using heavy metals as a, as a spin current source. Uh, this is about 50 times more than what is required for SDT. So when you compute the energy required to switch, then you see that SDT is way below SOT until uh, this five nanoseconds limit. Okay. Then, uh, of course, we cannot compare here, but by reducing the, the pulse length, then of course the, the total energy goes down. And so SOT becomes competitive. And in fact, we believe that this is the, the fast switching is the limit where SOT is really competitive also for reliability purposes. Okay. So uh, here are some uh, general comparison in terms of uh, cell size, SOT, uh, three terminal uh, cells are um, more costly than SDT, but uh, probably less than SRO. Uh, they need more energy to write, but they can be faster. It can be faster also in reading, at least at equal read disturbance rates. And uh, they can be pulsed many times without uh, uh, damaging the tunnel junction. Uh, there are several things that can be done to improve the efficiency of these devices. One is just plain downscaling that will reduce the, the absolute energy consumption. Uh, 
Another is to play with the fact that having three terminals allows for more effects to come into play, in particular, STT and VCMA can be both exploited to increase speed and efficiency. And then the holy grail would be increasing the SOT efficiency, or if you want the effective spinal angle, which in our devices is around 0.3. And so uh, materials or processes can be found that uh, increase the effective spinal angle, then this will be highly beneficial. Uh, here below, you see an extrapolation of the critical current required to switch uh, by downscaling uh, an MTJ to 30 nanometer diameter adding STTN or VSCMA, and this will lead to a, a, quite an interesting figure for critical energy required for switch. Okay. So uh, these are the conclusions of the first part. Uh, now, Hyder, I would like to ask you how much time do I have? Maybe none? 10 minutes, I think, with interruptions. So. Yeah. So because I could either stop here or I think ten minutes. Just I think that the next part of the ten minutes that you had will be interesting to many people here. Uh, why don't you do that? So uh, right. So now let's move on to the next topic. I'll skip some of this. Uh, so we we discussed magnetic tunnel junctions for for MRAMs, so for memories, but there is not only memory where spintronics can play a role, but also logic. And in particular, combining logic with memory is very interesting to eliminate one of the uh, you know, major bottlenecks in nowadays computing, which is the separation between memory and logic function. Uh, so this work is the result of a collaboration with the a group of Lara Heiderman. And I mentioned at the beginning, uh, Tsaucho Lua, whom you see here in this picture, making one of his devices, Alice Rabe. And uh, the, uh, the people in, in my group here, uh, and as well as other people at Paul Scherer Institute and Swiss Life Service. So uh, the idea is to um, use spins and magnets to uh, achieve non-volatility in logic devices. There are several proposals that have been put forward in the past. And uh, out of this, we single out the, the magnetic domain world logic, which has uh, several advantages. Uh, one, because when combined with SOT, with spin orbit torques, uh, then uh, the main walls can move extremely fast and efficiently. There are different ways and configurations in which this can be achieved. By controlling the chirality of the domain walls, one can control both the pinning and the main wall speed. Uh, one can also control the uh, exchange coupling to in synthetic antiferromagnetic domain wall race track. And, uh, and then there are already proposals for uh, using domain walls as information or domains as information carriers in, in race track devices as well as in magnetic logic devices. However, most magnetic logic devices uh, are. Uh, uh, let's say we, we lacked so far in electrically operated uh, magnetic logic devices. So one reason why uh, it was difficult to implement uh, logic gates using the main walls is the fact that one of the basic operations in logics, the inversion, uh, is hard to achieve for, for the main walls. Right. So uh, here is a is a proposal and also demonstration of how this can be achieved for um, domain walls. I believe this was in, in Permaloy, where you have a sort of a magnetic track with this uh, inverted Y shape, and then uh, by applying an external field, it, the main wall can be driven up the this cusp here and then uh, down again, and in doing so, the domain will have reversed. However, this cannot be done by an electric current. And so it's a major uh, obstacle towards implementing current-driven magnetic domain wall logic. So uh, now in order to show this, I think I'll have to skip all this part, but uh, let me just uh, present the principle. So one way to, uh, to go around this problem and 
achieving the main walls invasion is to exploit the uh, jaruzinski moria interaction that is present uh, at the interface between heavy metal and ferromagnetic layers. This jaruzinski moria interaction is well known for inducing the formation of nail walls with a well-defined chirality. Okay, and this is the chirality in, in platinum cobalt, for example. Now, the idea here is that if one can control the magnetic anisotropy of uh, the magnetic layer, one can extend the domain wall, basically produce a, a, a in, in this example here, it's a, an artificial in-plane region that extends the DMI coupling beyond the range of the domain wall. Okay. And this allows to, uh, to create uh, coupled nanomagnets where one uh, magnet points in plane and the other magnet points out of plane. Okay. And the direction of the two is actually currently coupled. Okay. So I'll show you just the final slide of this. So by controlling this chiral coupling, which basically means patterning region, regions of in-plane and out-of-plane magnetic anisotropy onto a single layer, one can achieve different effects. For example, one can design synthetic antiferromagnets uh, using planar structures, uh, which also present exchange bias, but uh, it's a sort of a chiral exchange bias. Uh, one can uh, go to more complicated uh, spin ice type of structures, uh, even synthetic skirmions. Uh, one can use this to induce feel free uh, spin orbit torque switching. So, uh, by switching, for example, the in plane part of the magnet, also the out of plane one will switch and vice versa. And one can use these structures also to inject domain walls. So, uh, now how to make a domain wall inverter starting from this structure? So um, here in this diagram, what you see is uh, a magnetic layer. Typically, this is the, the red region is cobalt, out of plane magnetized. The blue region is cobalt. Uh, this is less oxidized, so it has in-plane magnetization. And the bottom layer is platinum. Now imagine that we have a domain wall approaching from the left side, driven by a current. Okay, so we have a nail domain wall approaching, and uh, this is pushing this uh, uh, app magnetized region towards the in-plane region. And then, uh, ideally, what happens is that this uh, domain is annihilated, and a new domain with the same orientation is nucleates on the other side. And this is actually what happens experimentally. This is measured by uh, scanning transmission X-ray microscopy. And what you see, sorry, this is changing by itself. Uh, what you see is a domain wall approaching from the left side. Here, the white bar is the in-plane magnetized cobalt region. This domain wall is annihilated and then it emerges on the opposite side. But now if you look at the uh, sequence of domains here. Here we have black and white, and here we have white and black. So the domain wall is actually inverted in this process. It's actually interesting to think how this can happen uh, in terms of interaction. So we have models and simulations uh, that reproduce this effect. And this seems to be due to, to the fact that when a, a domain wall uh, is pushed against this in-plane region, the main wall is compressed. This leads to an unstable high energy uh, situation and also to the appearance of magnetostatic charges at, at the domain walls, which are uh, basically create a very uh, high energy situation for this in plane region, which eventually prefers to switch. So the in plane magnetization switches. And once the in plane magnetization switches, then uh, the region on the right of the in plane region is unstable, energetically unstable, because the DMI uh, does not favor this coupling. So for, for cold platinum left up uh, is not a favorable situation. So the system nucleates a down domain here. 
uh, and the reaction of the spin orbit torque in then uh, the uh, uh, torque due to the to the Jalazinski Mori interaction. And so this uh, eventually achieves domain wall inversion, and uh, one can also make it more efficient by uh, patterning the in-plane shape region in the form of a V. Okay, and uh, when this is the case, then the uh, rotation point is always fixed at the apex of the V, that's the most unstable point, and this makes the domain wall inversion process always occurring at the same uh, time, and also it's also fast. Okay, so uh, yes, this allows to invert sequences of of domains, as you see here. So we have white, black, white, and then we pulse the system with current, and at the end we have black, white, black. Uh, These uh, gates can also be cascaded, and uh, with this building blocks combined with the concept of a majority uh, logic gate, which was also already shown for for uh, dipolar coupled nanomagnets, one can construct more complex type of gate. Uh, here, we uh, this is the structure that, that uh, Zhao Chu Lua basically uh, invented, is that uh, if you have a, an in-plane region separating uh, two inputs, these are two inputs, uh, cobalt tracks on top of a platinum current line, this is this, this uh, brownish stripe here, uh, and then a bias terminal. Okay. Then the orientation of the magnetization at the output, which is this, this fork terminal here, will be determined by the Carl coupling through the in-plane region and by how many of the input regions are um, um, magnetized up. Or down. Okay. And so uh, one can realize an end gate or a NOR gate depending on the orientation of the bias terminal. So this is a reconfigurable logic gate. And this can be operated by currents. Now I don't have uh, time to show all of this, but uh, what I'd like to stress is that uh, by combining these gates, so uh, in particular, uh, the NAND gate makes this family of logic gates uh, complete. Mm -hmm. And also it is known that the main world can cross over uh, themselves, right? You can also uh, fan out domains in, in race tracks. So this allows to, to build more complex uh, logic circuits. Here you see a few examples that are made by combining uh, different uh, NAND, NOT, uh, Gates, different numbers, and this can all be operated by by currents and uh, provide uh, outputs. So here you see um, yeah, other examples of this uh, the manual logic structures. Okay, uh, skip that for the moment. But uh, before concluding, I would like to uh, just mention some of the issues that uh, still remain to be addressed. Okay. One that perhaps you've noticed when you look at this type of uh, uh, pictures here is that uh, even though the uh, logic gates are operated by currents, so the, the, the main propagation is driven by a current, the inputs in our measurements are defined by fields. And we have this uh, domain injector points here. Okay. Uh, so of course, one could use uh, rested field lines or uh, other types of um, systems to electrically induce domains. Okay. Uh, one way in which uh, it is uh, thought that this can be done is by um, essentially embedding magnetic tunnel junctions at the input terminals and controlling the formation of domains by spin transfer torque in this case. And this will also solve the problem of electrically reading the output state of such gate. So this integration part is certainly very challenging and uh, remains to be done. 
Uh, another uh, interesting point is that our devices are typically 800 to 100 nanometer wide. And uh, when scaling down farther, there are several issues uh, that concern the main wall propagation that can come up. For example, pinning, reduction of the main wall speed, and eventually this will lead also to, to uh, synchronization problems or uh, to the need for adding uh, large delay times. And another problem of magnetic domain wall logic is that it is extremely difficult to realize feedback loops. And so, uh, so far, this uh, can only be done electrically with an external electric circuit. So, uh, yeah, these are some of the problems that we face if we want to develop this uh, systems farther. I'll just uh, show the conclusion number two slide. Um, uh, I'll let you read it and thank you for your attention. Uh, thank you, Pietro. And I think uh, the rest of you can thank him. Maybe if you can put your hand up, I think is the way to, to do it here in this uh, webinar. And you'll see many, all of them are the 300 people that are online here uh, on Zoom. And then, uh, fortunately, the 120 or so that are the hundred or so that are in and YouTube cannot do that, but I'm sure they thank you as well. Um, so with that, uh, let me um, uh, ask you, uh, well, I'll put the hang down, otherwise <laughs> I, will not, I will think that they all want to ask a question. Um, let me go first to, to this person. Uh, so Neil, um, uh, Neil Schott uh, has a question. Maybe Neil, uh, you think you are now, you can speak now if you like. Can I ask a question? Yes. I hope you guys can hear me. We can hear you. Go ahead. Very good. All right. Thanks, Pedro, for the talk. Um, I think in the beginning, in the first part of your talk, you explained that this delay in the switching is essentially due to the delay in heating your sample. So I was, is it, so if that is correct the way I understood it, is there any way you can reduce the, for instance, or increase the thermal conductance of your sample to make that switching faster? And um, is there maybe also a way to reduce the currents by that you need for the switching, maybe by reducing the um, thermal capacity or something like that of the materials that you use? So uh, I would say if we want to you know, reduce the incubation time, then we, we should actually decrease the thermal conduct. I mean, we should heat more. That's the uh, the, the key there, uh, which of course has other disadvantages. Um, so if the system would be perfectly thermalized, then it would be very hard to switch, I believe, at least with magnetic and isotropy energies that allow you to, to maintain uh, you know, the, the sizable thermal stabilities. Like in our devices, we have about 50 kbt thermal stability. So uh, the, the easiest way is really to turn up the current, the SOT current, and that uh, does two, two beneficial things. It heats and it applies more torque. Uh, but of course, this requires more. Um, there are also um, sending an STT current, so through the pillar, this also can have heating effects. This is something we're currently investigating to see if, if the heat generated directly in the pillar is more efficient, uh, so that it eventually it requires less power, but we, we still have a sizable heating. It's, uh, I think it's a bit like going towards a heat-assisted magnetic recording in, in a way. Right? It's considering heat not as a necessarily a bad thing, but uh, it's something that can assist in the process that we, we try to reduce. Um, so the next question is from Sahid Hussein. Please, Sahid, go ahead and uh, ask your question. Sahid, are you there? Uh, hello, can you hear me? Yes, we can. Go ahead. Uh, yeah, so I had one question only that uh, the magnetic field that you have used for switching it. This was 90 millitesla. It's actually quite high to me. <laughs> so it is possible to to design a structure so that no magnetic field required for the same. Can you speak yeah. louder? It's difficult to hear you. So I can I can repeat the question. Let me just 
So, so yes, it is possible. Um, that's what I, I tried to mention here. So. This time does exactly that. So there is no external field here. Uh, there is an embedded magnet on top of the pillar, and that provides a stray field that is strong enough uh, so that the, the switching is entirely deterministic and also fast. And the stray field provided by this structure uh, is about 40 millitesla in this configuration. Okay. Good. But there are also other scheme, uh, as I mentioned, exchange bias to an antiferromagnet um, or introducing some kind of uh, geometrical asymmetry can also uh, then determine zero field switching. Yeah, the, the other part, I think I'm going to follow up your question with um, with Jesus Carlos Toscano. Uh, I'll ask together because it's similar to my question. Uh, the VCMA then, uh, when you require these large voltage, I guess in here you don't have it is probably from the shift of the band structure near the interface or something that is changing in isotropy, right? Yes. Exactly. It, uh, yeah. Have you considered other uh, other uh, materials like niobium or other parts uh, to to try to couple stronger to these bands? So uh, not yet. I mean, this, these structures are not optimized by VCMA. They have a VCMA coefficient that is uh, pretty standard for. For, uh, for cobalt iron and boron, uh, but it's not the, the highest that has been quoted in, in the literature. So I guess this can be done and we would, it would be very interesting to do it, but we haven't done it. Um, okay, the next question is from uh, Shivalik. Uh, go ahead, Shivalik, you have a question. You have to mute yourself, Shivalik. Okay. Maybe I can ask the question for him. He's not been able to mute himself. Um, uh, yeah, hello. Okay. Uh, Go ahead, Go ahead. Can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Yeah, uh, hello. Uh, thank you for the lecture. I have a question that uh, can this, uh, w uh, can we expand the idea of chiral coupling to develop a quantum processor, quantum information processor? <laughs> I'm, I'm sorry, I, I never thought about it. Um, Yeah, I, I don't think so. In in terms of uh, you know the, the schemes that are being, uh, I think the yeah, like, nowadays are much too large to uh, don't have any sort of coherence. I mean, in, in principle, uh, you know, chiral coupling is something that has been also observed for single atoms on surfaces, so isolated spins on surfaces. Um, so, in principle, it's possible, but I don't think that this will solve the quantum computing problems in the future. <laughs> Okay, sir. The next, okay, so the next question, uh, let me mention there, is from Daniele Pina. Uh, Daniele, go ahead, uh, please ask your question. Um, can you hear me? Yes. yes. Um, hi, uh, thank you for the, for the nice talk. I just have a quick question regarding the logic application you discuss uh, towards the end. Um, what are what are if there are any plans to grow to go beyond the, the constraint of, uh, of this graph planarity uh, for the logic device? So, mean, so everything everything is in two D. So you're you're limited to uh, electronic circuits that don't really have any overlapping connections. Basically, I, I think that's what you meant when you talked about the feedback loops. Yeah, I mean, uh, so everything that that would go in the third dimension would have to be, uh, you know, somehow hooked up to to CMOS uh, layers. So um, so far, we we don't see. You know, an easy way to integrate magnetic domain wall to stack magnetic domain wall structures on top of each other. Uh, one one could imagine having domain wall conduits extending vertically, but uh, you know the logic there. Uh, so making the fabricating the logic gates there would be even more difficult than it is just for plain race trucks. So I, I'd say this is a, yeah, it's a tough step in, in general for, for this. Yeah. Okay. 
Uh, and one last question, I think, for Matthias. I think I have to leave, but it left me here in a text. Uh, uh, in the Swiss, the, the, the switching uh, speed and the spin of a torque switching is limited by the domain one motion. Uh, and he was wondering if one could scale down the structures to have single domain elements and how would that affect the switching times and the incubation times, particularly? Yeah, but that, that's a very interesting point. It's something that we would certainly like to see, but so far in all the devices that we have that we have studied, we don't have evidence for for uh, coherent switching or single domain switching. So in, in coherent switching, really one should see uh, you know the switching start immediately because the torque is orthogonal to the magnetization at rest. Um, but we don't have evidence for that. Other groups have claimed that they, they start see single domain switching. Um, our devices are 18 nanometer uh, pillars. We also measure 16 nanometer diameter pillars. And still, we don't have evidence of single domain switching. In so, simulations, one, one starts seeing that, uh, I believe, around 30 nanometer diameters. Mm -hmm. But uh, we don't know. Um, so then, then I'm going to uh, ask, um, I think there's some hands up, so I will ask uh, to see if there's uh, questions there or whether people have their hands up. Um, so Gisela, uh, go ahead. If you, did you have a question, Gisela? Yes. Go ahead. Yeah, we can hear you a little bit below. If you can speak louder, it will be better. Oh, I speak louder. So uh, uh, thanks for the nice talk. I have a question concerning how to meet the challenge uh, of these extremely high current you use, especially for the domain wall motion, which is far too high uh, for any applications. I think despite the temperature rising, uh, which uh, changes significantly the magnetic behavior. Uh, so is there any idea to reduce uh, the currents to a tolerable limit? So, so there are two things to consider. One is absolute currents, okay? And absolute currents uh, is true that uh, in, in large devices, we use, uh, you know, order of milliamps. But uh, if you scale down the devices, then uh, one can reach below 100 microamps. And this is already within reach of, of you know, single CMOS transistor. And so it's not per se a limit, of course, uh, you know, one would like to use as, as little current and power as possible, but it's not a problem from the point of view of integration. Uh, from the point of view of current density, then you're, you're absolutely right. As I said, the uh, currents required to switch uh, by spin orbit torques for these systems are in the order of 10 to the 8 amps per square centimeter. That's about a factor 50 higher than, than STT. And so, uh, this is a is a problem that I, I don't think it will be solved by you know, using tungsten or platinum. We probably need some other uh, material system for that. And there are several uh, materials lined up for this, including topological insulators, for example, where uh, in very large uh, spin orbit torque efficiencies have been claimed. Uh, the point is th these materials are not so easy in integration friendly as as the standard metals are so for for the materials that we use they're all compatible with with that kind of line processes for CMOS and for more exotic materials this would remain to be proven but I think it's a it's one of the things that keep us uh, doing more investigation Let's see, one last question I think I'm going to take from Jesus. I think you, were, you wanted to ask a question, Jesus? Yes. Hello. Thanks for the talk. Hello. So my, my question goes in regard of the last set of devices that you introduced. And those were uh, your, your logic, uh, basically your, your application for, for, for logic devices. And uh, it's quite clear that they are quite large, right, in comparison to top-notch uh, 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 miniaturized uh, devices. So I guess the object of this part, part of the research, it, it goes in regards of um, speed, I guess, that, 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 that's what they excel. Uh, am I correct at assuming that, that they are not targeting, uh, let's say, a new approach of technology size-wise, but 
because I mean, of the novelty or and how fast they can go? So I think uh, you know the the main interest for us is right now to show that one can have uh, a, a current driven magnetic domain or logic, and mm. so that's a way to do it. And I think it's also quite interesting from the point of view of the, the phenomena involved. Mm-hmm. Now, if you if you start comparing right away with what CMOS can do, and of course there is a, a big gap, and um, speed here, uh, these devices can be fast. Uh, if you think so, the we have measured the domain wall velocity in this these systems. Uh, it's about 150 meter per second. So the current densities that we use. So, uh, and then you can think that an inverter. Uh, can be something in between 15 nanometers to, in the best of case, would be 10 nanometers wide. And so the time required for a domain to cross an inverter can be as, as small as uh, in 60 picoseconds for, for the smallest structure. But that's the best case, right? When you downscale things, then you run into other problems with the main walls moving into yeah. restructs. And so, um, also, I should say this is not the best uh, system for driving domains. And cobalt and platinum, there are better systems. And so, uh, this is also something where more research should be done in order to to achieve more efficient uh, domain wall motion. I think well, I think, I, um, I think I need to cut it short now. I think a few more hands up, but I'll uh, stop here now, and then maybe.